Good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining today. Our session. Uh, Rob will talk to us about putting the teach back into teaching. I hope you will enjoy the session for tonight. And looking forward to having you in our future sessions also. All right, great. Well, thank you for having me today. And welcome to everybody. Um, we have more people coming in and we'll just include them in. So I'm Rob Howard and hope you can hear everything all right. I'm coming to you today from not Kuwait, but sunny Poland where it's about eight degrees centigrade. And let's get started. Okay. Well, first, a little bit about me. Um, if you're not familiar with me, what I'm mostly known for is EFL Talks. And EFL Talks is teachers teaching teachers. What we're doing here today, we do live webinars and we record these. <coughs> excuse me, make them available to everybody around the world for free. And I have a few businesses. I have Online Language Center. This is where I teach people around the world online. Uh, Business Language Training Institute, where we teach teachers how to become business English teachers. And I'm also the joint web and online coordinator for the IATEFO BSIG, which is the Business English Special Interest Group. And tomorrow I'm on a plane off for the Visual Arts Circle, our image conference, which we have every year around the world. And this will be in Brussels. And I'm also the co-founder of Independent Authors and Publishers where we're trying to make publishers and individual authors available to the teaching public. So let's get started. <clears throat> First, I apologize for my voice. It's allergies. I'm not sick. I feel great. But I'm an EFL teacher. Okay, it's a bold statement. That's what I am. And I teach English. We just turn off the videos, the people popping in. And I teach English. I don't teach bullying. I don't teach 21st century skills. I don't teach critical thinking. I don't teach diversity in the classroom. I don't teach inclusion. I don't teach global issues. I don't teach sustainability. I don't teach racism, sexism, religionism, elitism, whatever ism of the week comes up. I don't teach any of this. I teach English. Now, these others, they're subjects and they're topics. They're topics and subjects that I do talk about, just like I talk about travel, movies, food, music. These are topics for practicing English. And the problem I have, if you go to conferences these days, everybody is talking about teaching inclusivity, bullying, sustainability. This is not what we're hired for. We're hired as English teachers. These are fluency activities, activities that we should use to make our students more fluent and comfortable talking about these subjects and topics. But 
it shouldn't be a personal agenda. And unfortunately, lately in EFL, it's turned into a personal agenda to be talking about some of these subjects. <clears throat> now, I know in some countries, especially maybe some of your countries, some of these are taboo subjects. They don't have to be taboo subjects if we don't teach to teach them. It's just subject matter. Now, if I'm teaching specific things, for instance, CLIL, if you're familiar with teaching a different subject in English, if I'm teaching exams, business English, subject specific ESP, then I may be working on something different. But normally I'm teaching English. People come to me for English class and that's it. They come to learn nouns, verbs, <coughs> adjectives, adverbs, pronouns. Sorry about the voice. They come to learn tenses and articles, conditionals, discourse markers. This is why I'm hired as a teacher. This is why they come to English classes. They don't come to learn critical thinking, inclusion, global issues, sexism. That's not what they signed up for. Nobody ever asked me to teach them any of those subjects. They want English, plain and simple. Now, I am an English teacher, as I said. I'm not a scientist. I'm not a psychologist or anthropologist, and I'm not a therapist, so I'm a teacher. It's my goal and my position to teach English and not take on the role and discuss things out of my realm. We need to ask ourselves as English teachers, do we have the sensitivity to discuss some of these subjects? Do we have the training to deal with these subjects? I'm not Coursera where you sign up for a specific course. <clears throat> if you go to conferences, often you're gonna hear a lot of this. And I know that technology is big. Um, there were a lot of talks about technology in Kuwait last year and people talking about maker projects, innovation, the latest trends, gamification, and of course, a million ways to use TED Talks. And I feel we're getting away from the point of teaching English. And this is the point. These are all conference hotkeys. These are what people want to hear about and people want to talk about. They're audience pleasers. Because if I say I'm going to talk about global issues, everybody goes, oh, so important, let me go. And everybody in EFL tends to jump on the bandwagon. For instance, when we talked about in the past, native speakerism, that was what everybody talked about for a year. Then it was the LGBTQ. It was bullying. Now it's global issues. These are bandwagon topics that everybody wants to talk about. Yet we're not talking about what the student needs, and that's learning how to speak English. We're pandering to the few people who are out there. But what about the student? What does the student want? Now, they want to improve their level of language, plain and simple. They come to us to improve. Do we look at the student's needs like we used to? Or are we looking at our own needs? 
And I feel sometimes too often teachers are looking at their own objective in their own needs and not what the student needs. So targeting on student objectives. <clears throat> are our objectives as a teacher aligned with their need to learn? They need English. It's what they come to us for. They're not looking for some clouded curriculum talking about different topics and subject matter, which is not important to them. So, odd topics. Please jump off the bandwagon. Now, talking a little bit about methodology. If you go to these conferences, you'll hear a lot about different methodologies. And over the years, methodologies have changed so much. Seems every other year, we have a different methodology. Let's take a look. One of the big things you hear today is to teach critical thinking. This is nothing different than the Socratic method from before. The flipped classroom, a new innovation a few years ago. This goes back to the 50s and even earlier with Frenet in France. Learning styles. This is something that was a hot topic for years until um, Howard Gardner himself said it was being misused and misinterpreted. And finally, a few years ago, the British Council finally agreed and everybody says, nah, learning styles, throw them out the window. It's multiple intelligences. Controlled practice. We're starting to hear this again. This is drilling. We did this 20, 30, 40 years ago. And even before, I learned French through drilling when I was a youngster a million years ago. Repetition over and over and over again. It's nothing new. 21st century skills or what I like to call the things we already do. We're making a big deal over 21st century skills. We've always negotiated. We've always talked to other people. These are nothing new. They're hot topics. Look at some of the others. Student-centered learning, PBL, TBL, community language, grammar translation. They've all come and gone, and they'll come back again. These are just topics for publishers and for speakers like myself to talk about at conferences. But are the students learning? Look at some of the methodologies. Just in the past few years, document what Scott Thornberry call, called out for everybody, throw away the textbook. Everybody jumped on the bandwagon until the publisher said, hey, it's how we make our money. Sell course books again. Demand high, something Adrian Underhill and Jim Scribner. I asked myself, when did we ever demand low? But are we teaching? These are buzzwords. They sell books, courses, they sell experts, they sell training. Strictly, they're recycling. So where are all these now? Where is the teaching? So let's get critical, but not critical thinking. Using critical thinking, which is the buzzword of today, the idea of critical thinking is to describe how they got to their answer with metacognitive awareness, getting feedback and 
getting their thinking aligned accordingly. Great. Critical thinking is extremely important in education. But research shows you can only learn critical thinking after we're properly taught and design a course specifically around critical thinking, which our English classes are not. They are not designed to teach critical thinking. <clears throat> and critical thinking was designed to be used for discipline-based courses. For instance, math, science, history, the basic core courses that we have. And they must use discipline-based courses or domain courses in order to develop critical thinking. Now, English is not a discipline-based course. And this is one of the problems. This. English is not a domain-specific skill. First language is a domain-specific skill. But English as a foreign or second language is not. Critical thinking requires higher-order thinking skills. And students don't have the vocabulary or the grammar or the level of language to deal properly with critical thinking. Now, these are some of the things that are involved in critical thinking. Interpretation, data, argument, reasoning, handling complexities, evaluation. Think about your students. Do they have the language ability to make these arguments in a classroom? If they're anywhere from A1, even some might say to C1, they don't have this level. These are C2 skills. So critical thinking should not even be brought up in the classroom until the student has the language ability to deal with these. So what about A1 to B2 students? What's their level of L2? Do they understand the questions we're asking for critical thinking? Do they even have the words, the grammar, the vocabulary, the thought to form a proper answer to properly achieve critical thinking. They don't. Okay, moving on. <clears throat> Look at these again. A1 to B2 C1 students. Do your students have the skills they need to properly make these arguments? Okay, so my supposition is we're setting our students up to fail in an English classroom because we're asking them to perform a task that they don't have the ability to succeed at. And this is why they're nervous, they're uncomfortable, they don't learn, and they run away and quit. Most of them fall. Critical thinking is difficult. It's a higher order skill. It takes mastery of lower level skills before you even try critical thinking. So think about this. Everybody's doing coding these days, writing programs. It's the latest trend in school. Let's take coding and compare it to language. Both have syntax, both have basics, and both have a level of mastery. Coding, you can learn the syntax in a week. 
you can learn the basics of coding in a month. You can achieve mastery at coding in a year. Do those time limits, are they the same for language? No. Mastery can take six to 10 years. How much can your student do in one week of language class, starting from zero? So critical thinking takes space practice, which we don't even use anymore in English classes. If you remember the old course book, course books did make time and plan out space practice, but not so much as they used to. Space practice takes time. Instead of two to three hours a week of working on the same thing, it's spreading this out. So two to three hours a week is 70 to 100 hours a year. Is that really enough? to achieve mastery. And does it fit our syllabus? I like to call this teaching with the goss, which is a grain of salt. It's like when you hear these things, consider them, don't go crazy. Our job is to find the gap in their language and to fill the gap. Remember, students don't know what is effective. If they come into a classroom, they think we as experts are teaching them exactly what they need to learn and how they need to learn. They don't know if they're getting an ineffective class. So the problem, students of course come to us with a lot of luggage or some of us say baggage. This is problems. They come to us fossilized language mistakes. They come to us frustrated. And whether you're teaching or coaching, it's our objective to reach their reality and to get through to them. Now, I'm going to show you some writing examples from some of my students to show you. <clears throat> One of my students in Russia, um, two master's degree in economics, a brilliant economist, is a 35 year top executive at Yandex Financial, which is like Google. He's been studying English for 12 years. He's got a very interesting vocabulary because he reads everything about economics. But then look at some of his writing samples. Not so far ago, what should you do? Do matters for you? Do something or not? We as sociable. You know, these are basic mistakes that should have been fixed somewhere between B1 and B2. He has a problem using articles, the past tense, a problem with word order, conditionals, adjectives, and perfect tenses. Another one, PhD in economics. She's a 45-year-old Russian university. She's the dean of economics in Siberia. Again, tuition fees is US. These are basic lower level mistakes. And these are fossilized mistakes that need to be fixed before they can move on. Problem again, formulaic chunks, idiomatic language. Another one, she actually lived overseas for six months in the EU. She did her master's at a British university. The 
just take a quick look at some of the examples. These are basic mistakes our students should not be making. But you notice wrapped around these mistakes is higher level language. So they're almost there, but they need help with some of these problems. And I won't go through, I've got more and more, but having all the students I've been teaching online in Russia lately, great vocabulary, great listening skills, great reading skills, speaking, eh, but their writing and their grammar are atrocious. Why? Because we're not teaching writing and grammar anymore in classes. Because we're so busy with these other hot topics, we've let grammar, writing, and the basics of English go away. Speaking is focused on meaning, context, and communication. Now, writing, however, we should be focusing in on grammar, content, and correctness. So look at the difference between what we're working with. And most of the time, we're working with their speaking and not with their writing. This is fine if people just want general communication skills. But most people today are learning English for the workforce because they need to use it in their work. So what should we be teaching? First of all, confidence. I don't think we teach them enough confidence lately in how to build up and feel that they are speakers. We need to have meaningful conversations. And when I say meaningful, these are things that are relevant to the student. We've actually gone away from error correction. Everybody says, oh, wait till the end. Don't focus in on all the mistakes. Focus in on what's right. But we're not fixing the problems this way. Feedback, always important. Always give your students feedback. At the end of every lesson, I usually give feedback. Praise your student. We always know this. These are nothing new about teaching. But have we made time to do all this? Make them read. I seriously find students aren't reading enough in English. If they're doing it for business, they should be reading journals, newspapers. If they're students, in university, they should be reading something every day. Kids are great because they usually like to read. And if you find them something interesting, <coughs> they will read. Emails. Work with their emails. Take a look at the emails that they're writing. Take a look at the emails that they deal with every day. This is realia. You can bring this into your class. Have them bring in journals to the class. If you're teaching adults or you're teaching students who are working in internships, have them bring in journals from their job. News, books of interest, ebooks. You know, they have a treasure chest of information sitting in their pocket. And I don't mean their wallet, it's their cell phone. And we really don't take advantage of the cell phone. Make them listen to podcasts. Podcasts are great. They focus in on language, you can focus in on listening skills. 
most students ride the bus, take public transportation. They have plenty of time. Instead of tweeting and checking out Instagram, they can be listening to podcasts, improving their English. National Public Radio out of the States, the BBC, this will get them used to language. We're giving them target listening, specific things we want them to listen for, whether it be accent, whether it be idioms, whether it be formulaic chunks or grammar. Excuse me. <clears throat> okay, YouTube videos. YouTube is free. There's billions of YouTube videos which you can do target listening on virtually anything you want. I had a student in Brazil years ago who was working with Chinese engineers in oil and gas, having trouble understanding their accent. We went to YouTube and we put in Chinese engineers speaking English. We found hundreds of different videos. So you can find almost anything you need on YouTube and your students can be listening to build vocabulary and to build up listening skills. I have my students writing an essay a week. Now, they don't have to be huge. I have them do about 250 words every week. It's not much, half a page. We pick different subject matter and we pick different targets. For example, I'll say, I want you to work on something that's happened in your past and do everything in the present perfect or the past perfect or use the continuous or use four or five conditionals. So target what you're looking for for grammar within these essays. It's great practice and it doesn't take long to correct. Have them reflect on everything that they take in and use new intake. Remember, I consider that we're not teaching them English for today. We're teaching lifelong learners. And what we're trying to do, I try to make them autonomous learners because they're going to be learning forever. I'm a hundred years old and I grew up in the United States. I'm learning new English words still. They're going to for the rest of their life. So teach them how to be learners and how to learn. Teach them how to study. I'm amazed. I don't know about your countries. In Russia, in Brazil, in parts of the UK, in Europe where I've taught, they're not taught the proper way to study. Make them do presentations. I always have them do at least one presentation within a semester, and they have to prepare for these. This will help them with their public speaking skills, but also it helps them target in on specific language. I have them keep a learner's notebook. First thing I have my students do is take notes. All new words that they've learned, all new phrases, all new formulaic chunks go down in the notebook. And every week, at the end of the week, they would need to flip through and try and reuse and recycle some of the language from the past. Learner's Notebook is also good for gaps. I have them think of a word in their own language that they would normally say and make sure that they understand it in English. If they don't, it's going to go in the notebook and they have to look it up. Word banks. 
Word banks are apps. They're great for learning because not only will they give you words, but you can put in your own words that you're learning. And what they do is they cycle these with spaced repetition to make sure you're improving and learning new vocabulary. So spaced repetition, it's perfect. It's built right into the word bank app. Thesaurus, I'm still amazed at how many people in the world don't know that the thesaurus is a dictionary of synonyms. When you learn a new word, look it up in the thesaurus, get three or four different choices for that word. This will help you later in paraphrasing and in writing. Take courses. For example, I have my students, they may be an accountant for years. They know accounting, but they know accounting in Russian or they know accounting in Portuguese. So I say, why not take a free Coursera or Udemy course in English for basic accounting? You understand the accounting, but now you can hear the language of accounting or any subject. Translation. Don't be afraid to do translation. They're going to have to do this all their life. You know, think about the typical foreigner. We tried for years to get them away from using translation. But in most cases, I'm going to sit there and talk to one person in English and one person in my own language. I need to be able to do this code switching. So I don't think there's anything wrong with translation. They're going to do it all their life. Help them to fill the vocabulary gaps that they have. And here's a fill in the gap. Give you a second to figure out what it means. Say no to gap fills. I don't know your feeling, but I really hate gap fill exercises. They leave too much to be unsaid because gap fills, we tend to be looking for one specific word and they might have 10 or other words that could fit and do work, yet we mark them wrong. Teach them how to practice. Teach them the right way. A cool thing I do is I use WhatsApp for pronunciation. And let's see. I'm actually going to show you mine. I have a student that one of her major problems is pronunciation. And what happens is she forgets the words that she's working with. So what I do is every class, I write down the word that she's having problems with, and then I record it, and I send it to her on WhatsApp. And what she does is during the week, she looks at the word, listens to it, and constantly repeats. And I thought of this idea one day. It's been working great. She's now probably added about 100 new words that she can properly say. Use speech-to-text apps. There's a lot of free ones. What I do is when I have my students write an essay, I have them read the essay to a speech-to-text app. Make sure that the app is typing what they're actually saying. It's free. Okay. And these are all free 
resources. Everybody likes free resources. Now, a little disgusting here, but I'm trying to make a point. When I was a kid, I loved to read. In the bathroom, I had a dictionary. When I went to the bathroom, which I thought was an awful waste of time, but necessary, I used to read the dictionary. After I finished the dictionary, I started with the thesaurus. And by the time I entered kindergarten, I had a sixth grade reading level. It's because my aunt was an English teacher. She got me reading early, but think about it. This is how you figure and show students the value of time. Everybody goes to the bathroom. <laughs> if you spend five minutes a day, what are you doing? Playing games, checking Instagram. Five minutes every day equals 30 hours in a year. 10 minutes every day is 60 hours of extra studying and learning time every year. 15 minutes, 90 hours of extra learning. If they're in the bathroom for more than 15 minutes, they better see a doctor, there's probably something wrong. But in order to be skillful at what you want, it takes practice. I'm a professional musician. I used to practice trumpet three hours every day, minimum, minimum. From the time I was five years old, I don't do it anymore. I'm old. Three hours minimum, oftentimes five or six hours. This is what it takes. Do you think Michael Jordan just went and learned how to do a layup? No, he practiced for hours every day. Three hours a day is 1,100 hours a year. It's amazing when you actually show them the math. Think of how much better you would be at any skill in your life, if you had 1,100 hours extra to practice, it's 46 days. You're gaining a month and a half. Help to motivate them to want to spend extra time. You got to do the work as a teacher. We have to get involved. We have to force them that they have to do the work. But we need to get back, I feel, to teaching English and get rid of all this other stuff that people tell you we should be teaching them. You know, so be the teacher you become, not what they say you should be. And I realize if you're working under a course syllabus, you're working under school directives, it's a little harder to have some freedom to do some of these things. Try. So, as we get near the end, teachers love acronyms, so I'll give you a good one. This is what we need to do again to teach. So with that, that's it. I think we need to put the teaching back in. And I thank you. And if you want, we can open it up if there's any questions. I'm gonna stop sharing here. And let me open up the chat room. Hi, Mohammed. <laughs> so
So if you have some questions or comments, you can type in the chat room. I hope I've given you some good ideas. If anybody would like to speak or ask a question, I can turn on your microphone. Is anybody still here? <laughs> Thanks, Mohammed. Hello, Rob. Hello. So, see if there's any questions. Hello, hello, Rob. Can you hear Hi. me? Yes. Well, I've been trying to figure out how to speak over here. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah, you just have to unmute the microphone. Yeah, of course I yeah. was trying to type, but then I, I was like, okay, you know what? I'll just speak. Good. So. Thank you so. Thank you so much. Yeah. First of all, thank you so much. It was really, really beneficial. It was oh, really okay. got to you to come and speak for us. Thank you so much, Doctor Rob. Thank you. Yeah. My pleasure. It's I love being here. I wish I was in Kuwait right now. I have my boat in the other room that I've got from Kuwait. Thank you, everyone. And anybody have some more ideas that they think could be helpful? I know everybody's big in technology. Something that maybe you're doing that doesn't involve technology that's working. Um, Bob, I have a question. Um, you're talking about drilling. Um, um, how can we use drilling? Like, what kind of uh, activities that we would do it in such a way that it's not only uh, um, like to do drilling, but in a more interactive way. Yeah, I've um, I've done different types of drilling activities and tried to adapt some, and I still work with them. For example, what I will do um, the most is drilling questions because I feel we don't focus enough on asking questions. Teachers ask the questions, students always answer. They never ask. So I like to do like in a classroom environment, everybody needs to talk to the next person in line using only a question. And what they have to do is find out a secret answer that I've given to somebody and the way that they do this is they're constantly repeating different types of questions. Like, what is it? What does it look like? What does it sound like? What does it smell like? You know, just depending on the level. And this is a type of drilling. Sometimes it's just repeating the phrases over and over again until they can pronounce perfectly. Okay. Anyone else have some good drilling that they do? Here, I'll, I'll give you a perfect example. Um, my first French class was 50 years ago. And in the old days, we had the tape recorders and it was repeat, repeat, repeat. I can still remember the first line of my French book, which was bonjour. <laughs> um, it was, uh, now I forget it. 
It was, my name is Jean Cluny in French. Um, you know, drilling does get into your head. And we made drilling a bad word because it was boring. But it is necessary to repeat. You know, think about if anybody's a musician, how many times do you have to practice the scales? I hate to think I must have played the scales a couple of million times on the trumpet. That's drilling, but it's necessary to achieve a higher level. What else? I agree with the breakdown part. Uh, when it comes to teaching over here, it is very necessary for us teachers that we break down even a very simple concept and then teach. And once you know that we have really established a foundation of that concept, then we start drilling. Drilling is more like an assessment, we can say. Like it work, It's more like how we are somehow evaluating what we have done while mm -hmm. creating a foundation. So yes, I do agree. I totally agree what you said. It is really important. Yeah, I, um, I try and use drilling as a practice before assessment for me. And when I do the assessment, I tend to use role playing more. And what I noticed now, um, you know, everybody's talking about using cahoots as a teaching tool, which I don't think it should be a teaching tool, but it is a good quizzing tool or assessment tool that makes that part of it fun. But um, yeah, I, I really think we did students a disservice by getting rid of drilling. I remember there is a school in Brazil. It's a private course that that's their entire course is drilling. It's like, um, I am going to the store. You are going to the store. And the teachers actually get arthritis from clicking their fingers and they retire after a few years. The students come out speaking perfectly. The problem is because all they did was drilling and never taught grammar, they don't know what they're saying and they can't make up a sentence unless they drill. So again, it's balancing everything. Okay, regarding grammar, um, do you think, should we teach the students grammar like grammar, um, the noun, the verbs, for example, um, being, I, I speak English, okay? So if, if somebody reads a sentence, um, hearing it, I know if there is a mistake or not. But if you tell me what the rule is, I tell you I don't know the rule. Do you get what? Because we are yeah. all second language speakers, but because we were taught in English, I, I, I listen and I know when there is a mistake. But if you tell me, explain to me why there is a mistake, I wouldn't know. So yeah. the question is, how should we teach grammar um, for people to know how to explain it? Or should they just, as you say, drill by reading too much, or reading, I mean, uh, pieces, or do you get what I mean, Rob? Exactly, I do. You know, I've been teaching for 20 years. I used to teach grammar, teach rules, and then teach usage. And I found they didn't learn the grammar and they didn't learn very well how to use it. Then I tried teaching communicatively where they just talked and no rules of grammar at all. And then what I found is that they didn't figure out why it was that way. The methodology I'm kind of using now is teach them how to say it how to write it, and as they become a little bit more advanced, explain the gram grammar of it. You know, it's totally different from mathematics you would or science. You would never say, 
all right, mix these chemicals together, watch it explode, and then let's see why. But I'm finding this to be a little more effective because first they feel comfortable with it, and then they can understand the rule behind it. Does that help? Okay, okay. So you first you teach them how to say it, then how to write it, and then after that you go into the rules. Exactly. And, you know, it's sort of, they're sort of getting the language holistically, but they're doing that outside of the classroom already. So really what I'm doing is helping them to learn holistically because they're watching TV, they're watching movies. I'm sure you have it. You know, you always get a student who comes to class and says, teacher, I heard this phrase in a movie. What did they mean? Or I heard them say this, that doesn't make sense. Show them with grammar how it does or how it doesn't. And then they're a little more interested. How about the Mohammeds? Any questions from? We got three Mohammeds here. Uh, Hi, Hi Mohammed. We can hear you. Hi, Rob. How are you? I'm great. And you said, oh, thanks. Thank you. Thank you so much for that uh, valuable uh, presentation. Just, uh, just, to have a, 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 just to have a quick question to you. Which, is, which comes first from your point of view? Accuracy or fluency? during teaching and speaking? Um, huge argument. I, I actually took it out of this presentation because it causes a good argument. I use, it depends. If you're talking to a guy who's learning English to travel, fluency is more important. If you're talking about a doctor, a lawyer, a businessman, accuracy is much more important than fluency to them. And I never realized this until I was in Brazil and I went to a doctor. Do turned out the doctor spoke English perfectly. We were talking about golf because he used to play golf near my house. We went on for 15 minutes talking about golf. And then we get to the medical part. He immediately started speaking Portuguese. And I said, why don't you speak English? And he said, if I say one inaccurate wrong word, it's a life or death situation. It made me rethink. Some people, accuracy is more important than fluency. For some, fluency is more important. So it's the balance for each person. Did that help, Mohammed? Yeah, thank you for that. Yeah, I, I agree with you. Yeah, yeah. it, 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 it yeah. depends, but I, I guess also that it depends on the level of the learners themselves. Yeah. Yeah, and, and the target behind learning the language. Yeah, I think while they're learning, of course, work on fluency. And at lower levels, you know, if it's not for their job, you work on fluency. And for me, that helps them build confidence and it makes them a better speaker later. But realize why they're learning English and realize at what point 
you need to switch over to accuracy, if at all. I mean, if I'm teaching a taxi driver English, they don't need much accuracy, but they want fluency because they talk and talk. Yeah, sure, sure. Yep. This is correct. Thank you. Great. Good question. Uh, can How you say it again, Bob? The question? The, the issue about fluency versus accuracy? Yeah, it depends on the learner because, for example, a taxi driver needs fluency. A doctor needs accuracy because one word can make a big difference. So it depends on the needs and the objective of the learner. At early levels, I think fluency is the most important. Just get them talking. And I actually, you know, looking at some of the course books, I think we're so worried about accuracy at a young level that they're afraid to talk and it makes them shut up, which is why they don't gain confidence at an early time. This is one thing I love is working with cognates because they already know the words. I'll give you a great example. Um, in Portuguese, they have a word acostumado, which means accustomed to. In English, we teach them used to. And then at B2, we teach them accustomed. Perhaps what we should do is at A1, teach them accustomed, and later teach them used to. They would speak much easier at a much sooner in their career. Just my thought. Interesting. Yeah, very interesting. Yeah. You know, I don't know, do you have a lot of cognates in your language? To English? I don't know. I don't know either. Um, Mr. Mohammed, maybe he can answer that. You know, a lot of words. Yeah, that, can, yeah. can you say that again, please? Do you have a lot of cognates, you know, words that are similar between the languages in your language? Yeah. Actually, uh, in Arabic, you know, we have maybe some uh, words coming from Turkish language or so, but the, the, uh, from time to time, they, they became part of the Arabic language, you know, mm -hmm. like, like uh, uh, shay, uh, we call it like tea in English, and, and uh, in Arabic we see shay, and Turkish they see chay. Mm -hmm. So this is, yeah, yeah. yeah. And also, yeah. And also and so from, it, from, English, uh, from English as well. Yeah. What For example, it, it, we say, For example, we say in, in Arabic, we say uh, sandwich. Uh, sandwich, we say it in, in Arabic. In English, sandwich, as you know. So, um, computer, it's, so some words are taken from other languages and became part of Arabic language. Yeah, mm -hmm. so, yeah. as part of modernization and, and uh, renewal in the, uh, the, the language. Great. Well, then, it would be really smart then if we started and focused with those words just to get them speaking quicker. This yeah. would build confidence much faster rather than teaching them words that don't make sense to them in a different language. Yeah. Great, thank you for that. You're welcome there. Another thing I'd like to add concerning critical thinking. You said that maybe you don't believe a lot in, in such, you know, new te terms, terminologies like critical thinking and so. But I suggested that if it's used as part of the curricula, the, the, the syllabus, uh, syllabus, as part to encourage the students to debate, to discuss about uh, putting it as a kind of problem or so, 
and help them for thinking for uh, solving the problems, problem solving techniques, and using critical thinking to find solutions to problems, to a problem that faces them. For example, when you say if uh, I can, I can put it as part of uh, a course, for example, I say, if you are in, um, in a ship and the ship wrecked and you were the, the only survival uh, person and you went to a desert, uh, a desert uh, island, Please, I, I talk to the students, please in groups of three, discuss what are we gonna do to keep alive on this island while all you have is, for, for example, a knife and you don't have anything else. So what are you gonna do? How mm -hmm. can the knife help you to live? Please try to get out. And so I can, I can help them try to think deeper and deeper, find ways. Yeah. yeah. And what do you think about that? I, I agree with you, but what level students? It should be, I, I guess, maybe B two or B one. Can it 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 depends. Yeah. It's, it depends. I, I do agree with you. Don't get me wrong. I do think critical thinking is extremely important in education, and I think that we can use things like. This is a great example. What if we can use it yes. to talk about conditions and situations? But I think, for example, does a B1 student know water filtration? <laughs> um, words like stranded. Do they know all the conditionals well? And if they don't, by asking them questions that they don't have the language to answer, we make them frustrated. And some of the course books that I've seen, they're trying to use critical thinking at A1. No way, no way. I'm learning how to say, my name is, Oh, it's Je m'appelle Jean Cluny. I remember my <laughs> French. Um, you know, I'm just learning how to say my name, and you're asking me to critically think using words I don't know. So it, it's again, and it's balance. I'm, I'm not saying don't use it, and that's a great a great role-playing activity that you mentioned, if they have enough vocabulary to seriously answer the question. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, I do agree. Uh, yeah, sure, I do agree with you. But for maybe the level of B1 and B2, as you said, that we can just give them at the beginning some expressions, sure. some, some, uh, some words to help them, just as key words, for opening the door for them, encouraging them to, to talk, to show, show them a video or so. Yeah, mm -hmm. I, I think, you know, just just to encourage them to use the language because sure. the, our target is to help them speak and to practice using the language authentically, you know, yes. in real situation. I, I think this is great, giving them the target language that they need to work with. Now, now you're thinking critically about their critical thinking, which is great, but I don't think everybody's doing this. That's the problem, you know? Yeah, I do, uh, yeah. I do agree they, with you, yeah. Yeah, I, I remember in Summit, I, we used Summit series uh, years ago in a course that I taught. And there was a story about mountain climbers who got stranded. And they had all these different sentences. And I took the sentences and cut them up into little pieces of paper. And you had to put the sentence in order to make the story right. And the first time I tried it, I didn't realize till halfway through, they didn't understand half the vocabulary. 
So I'm looking at a high level critical skill that they can't do because of lack of vocabulary. Now, once they knew the vocabulary, yes, they're smart enough to use it to do it. So very good. Thank you. Thank you. I'll put it in my next book and give you credit. <laughs> no money, but credit. <laughs> Thanks, Hope. Thank you. And Rhonda, did you have anything else that you wanted to say? Uh, no, that would be great. Uh, very good points. We really, I, I personally don't think about it this way, so it's really good. Thank you so much. Appreciate that. Well, thank you, everyone. And thank you, Rhonda. It's always a pleasure to do this. We're so. looking, we're looking forward uh, to more sessions from you, the experience. Anytime, I'm always learning, so I'd love to share. Just know where will to we, find me. Yeah, will we be getting the video? The... Uh, yeah, I've, I'm recording the video on my other computer, so I'll send it to you. Um, give me a couple of weeks, because I'm leaving tomorrow for two weeks. So. Okay. I'll send okay. it to you. Okay. okay. Thank you so much. Really appreciate that. And thank you for those who attended the session. We really appreciate your coming on board and listening to this very interesting lecture today. Great. Well, thanks, thanks everyone. And again, thanks, Rhonda. Hope you feel better, Rob. I hope I have a voice. I have two conferences to speak at. <laughs> so, Great. Good luck. Uh, Good luck. Thank you. Thanks. Bye now. Bye, everyone. Bye.